that, uh, this is going to be Jared Wilhite. Will Sorry, Jared. <laughs> uh, so Jared is a aerospace engineer at the NASA Glenn Research Center. He began working for GRC as a Pathways intern in 2011 and converted to a full-time employee in the Thermal Systems branch in 2016. His work involves modeling aerospace systems, vehicles, and their components using thermal and fluids analysis software. Prior to joining NASA, he attended the University of Cincinnati, where he learned, earned his bachelor's degree in 2014 and master's in 2016, both in aerospace engineering. He's currently pursuing a PhD in aerospace engineering at Case Western Reserve Unit University through NASA Glenn's Graduate Studies Program. So with that, go ahead and take it away, Jared. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jared Wilhite. <clears throat> My co-author is Jason Wendell. And today I'll be presenting solar white thermal coating for cryogenic propulsion systems. Okay, first I'll go into some background information on the project. Then I'll go over our overall collective approach to the project, followed by the modeling approach that I took I develop the thermal model of the system, then I'll end with results and conclusions. So thermal control coatings are designed to have specific radiative properties, which vary depending on the desired application. For instance, these coatings can be used to minimize the amount of external heat absorbed by a surface in space, or to regulate radiative heat exchange between onboard spacecraft components. The work that I'm presenting today is part of a recent and still ongoing NIAC study focused on cryogenic selective surfaces or thermal coatings that are made of material that have low absorption of solar radiation as well as a high emittance of infrared energy, which can enable cryogenic storage as well as superconductor operation in space. But for this application, we'll focus on cryogenic storage. So this figure shown here shows the sun's spectral irradiance, which starts to become significant at around 0.2 to 0.3 microns. So for this type of application, it's important to have um, it's important to have a, a material that can reflect a vast majority of the sun's irradiance at lower wavelengths while emitting radiation in the longer wavelengths. So current state-of-the-art thermal control coatings absorb a significant amount of ultraviolet and long wave infrared radiation, which is a challenge that we need to overcome. You can see the current state-of-the-art, um, a few coatings are AZ-93 white paint, single layer silver, as well as chi-optic quartz. This absorbs the least amount out of the three. However, a much lower percentage is needed for cryogenic storage. So for this project, a lot of testing and studying was done on different white powders that we could use for the solar white material. Ultimately, our group decided to go with yttrium oxide, mainly due to its ability to reflect a majority of the sun's irradiance, specifically ultraviolet or UV above 0.235 microns through infrared up to 8 microns. And this equates to a solar absorption of about 0.2%, which is much lower than state of the art. And other positive properties of this material are that it's lightweight, hydrophobic, and chemically stable. This picture on the left shows a cryogenic thermal coating, which is composed of a thick scattering layer of yttria or solar white on th a thin silver reflector. Since the yttria has low solar absorptivity, the scattering layer is able to reflect the UV and visible radiation, as well as the near to mid infrared radiation, while the thin silver reflects the far infrared radiation from about 8 to 12 microns. And at the longer wavelengths, you'll see that the scattering material becomes emissive and then radiates this energy. And this helps to provide cooling. So the combination of the thin silver reflector with the scattering layer of solar white material can theoretically reflect about 99.9% .9 of the sun's energy when used in deep space. In order to, te to test the solar white coatings, 
Yttria powder had to be fa fabricated into rigid samples as shown in the top right corner. The fabrication process included compressing the powder at high pressures and then centering it in an oven to make samples for testing. The fabrication and reflectance testing and even initial cryogenic testing was done by our project team members down at Kennedy Space Center. And then the samples were sent up here to Glenn for cryogenic testing in our deep space solar simulator, as shown in the bottom picture. The DS3 facility is designed to simulate a deep space environment, deep space thermal conditions, using a thermal vacuum chamber, shown here, optically dense walls, and also cryo cooler, cold head adapter, shown here, which establishes a cryogenic thermal background at temperatures down to 12 Kelvin. The facility also includes a xenon lamp solar simulator, which is not shown in the picture. It also is equipped with silicon diodes, which are used to measure temperatures of the sample and different parts of the simulator to get an idea of the temperature of the simulator environment. Light energy measurement technique was also used to measure the energy input at the sample. So far, eight test series have been completed at this facility, consisting of both no light and light on conditions, which I'll go more into a few slides from now. So this is a picture of my thermal desktop model of the entire DS3 setup, starting with these components. This thin red surface is the solar lamp, which radiates light energy through this half inch viewport, half inch diameter viewport. It transmits light energy through the silica lens, this light blue, to the solar white sample downstream. The solar white sample is held in place by Kevlar strings on the top and bottom, and the sample holder, which is all contained within the cold cube. The other components are the cold head adapter, which you saw on the previous slide, and that sets the temperature um, of the vacuum chamber to 12 and a half Kelvin. Also, you have the lens cover, which contains the optical equipment and also the aperture. <clears throat> so I was tasked with developing the thermal model so that we could get a better understanding of the energy inputs to the sample. And also so we could verify the results obtained during the test as well as determine how the infrared or IR affects the simulator environment. So I'll quickly go over how I developed the solar lamp simulation. So as you saw, it's a thin surface and it's represented by a single node. And I applied the optical property called normal on the active side of the surface. And this allows the light rays that leave the surface to be collimated with an emissivity of one. And I also disabled the CONCAP tab, which is a feature in thermal desktop. This was done before analysis so that the surface would not be generated. And this is mainly done so that the, um, so that the lamp is only there for the purpose of emitting light energy downstream through that viewport that I showed in the previous slide. Another thing to point out is the model includes two different radiation analysis groups. The first one includes all of the components except for the solar lamp surface. And the other radiation analysis group includes the lamp, solar white sample, and the silica lens. And this was done to ensure that the light from the solar lamp is only applied to the silica lens and the sample and no other components besides those. Lastly, the lamp surface is set to output rad k's as heating rates in the radiation analysis task. And this was one of the last things that was done before running the simulation. And this is to enable the lamp surface to radiate a specific amount of light energy through the half inch viewport and that's in the aperture. And this transmits light again downstream to the silica lens and the sample. 
Wavelength dependent properties is another modeling feature that came into play when developing this model. And this was mainly because optical properties for both the silica glass and the solar white material are both, they both vary with wavelength. So as you can see here, this is a plot of the transmissivity versus wavelength for silica glass. And you can see that it varies quite a bit from the short to near IR um, all the way to um, mid IR. But in the long wave radiation, it's not as much of a factor. And for the radiation analysis, I went from wavelength range of 0 to 25. And this was because yttria, the emissivity went from 0 to 25 in the wavelength band. And that's why I did that. So previously, I mentioned that we ran eight test cases at the DS3 facility. And those two test cases looked at, or those eight cases looked at two different tests, which were light on and no light. And this involved the solar lamp being turned on or off, as the name implies. So the no light case, in which the lamp was off, was run in order to expose the solar white sample so a complete 100% deep space cold cube with no light source. However, after running the test, it was discovered that the sample still reached a higher temperature than the 12 Kelvin background. And it was determined that this was due to IR leaks that were present within the sample. In order to further investigate this, I ran the model for these two different test cases based on the conditions. So first, the no light case include the solar lamp being turned off. And this is done to, uh, again, or simulate the ambient emissive environment within the chamber. So for this case, I have the lamp outputting, the lamp surface outputting a calculated value of 43.1 milliwatts per square centimeter. This is done to essentially help the model, or it helps to model the parasitic IR heat loads that the sample is exposed to during testing. For the light on case, um, this is a typical case in which the solar lamp is turned on. So the maximum light intensity that was used during tests was 180 milliwatts per square centimeter. So when you add this plus that calculated ambient IR contribution, you get a total of 223.1, and that is what I used for the output for the light energy for this case. So now for the results for the no light case. So the cold cube and the sample holder are both at um, close to 12 and a half Kelvin due to the boundary condition of this cold head adapter. Other nearby components are close to that temperature as well, like the lens cover, average temperature of that within the 20 Kelvin range. You also have um, the silica lens and the solar white sample, which are the only components that you can see are at relatively higher temperatures. This is due to the radiative exposure from the solar lamp. So as shown in the last slide, um, only the calculated ambient IR contribution is emitted from the lamp surface for this case. And as the lamp radiates that light energy or IR energy, so the silica lens, some of the energy is absorbed while the rest is transmitted to the sample. You can see the sample is the warmest component. And although you have some IR transmitting through the silica lens, or some light energy, I mean, um, the sample still is able to get down to a temperature of 61.5 Kelvin. Now for the light on case, you notice that the trends are pretty similar with this case where you have the cold head adapter pretty much driving all the temperatures down of the nearby components to close to 12 and a half Kelvin, except for the sample and silica lens, which are exposed to that radiation from the lamp. So you'll see here that both the silica lens and sample are 
considerably higher temperatures than the no light case as expected due to the great, greater light intensity value. There's also some delta T from the inner diameter to outer diameter, and that's because um, the light energy from the lamp is directed through this viewport where the inner diameter is located. So although you only have a two Kelvin, delta T of two Kelvin, which is pretty low, but still wanted to point that out. And the sample, of course, is higher just due to the greater light intensity in this case. Although the silica, so now conclusions, although the silica lens did absorb some amount of light energy, decent amount was still transmitted to the sample. This was mainly due to, like I showed, the transmissivity versus wavelength plot. There's considerable, there, there was an increased amount of transmissivity at the near to mid IR wavelength band, which helped contribute to this greater sample temperature. And I also forgot to point out that there was some heat generated by the silicon diodes, which were used as a temperature measurement instrument. Although it was, um, it only generated about 10 microwatts, it's still, um, it's a minor factor, but it, also, it does contribute to sample temperature increase because the sample has a relatively small surface area. And light intensity was also a factor in the difference between silica lens and sample temperature. Overall, the model helped to gain an understanding of the energy inputs to the solar white sample, including the effect of IR on components. And it also validated the results obtained during tests. So the project findings through our collaborative efforts from our project team, both down at Kennedy and here at Glenn, help to verify that solar white can be used for cryogenic applications. And right now, it is currently being planned for in-space performance testing on the space station. So next steps for, from a thermal modeling standpoint include exploring ways to apply the modeling strategies, like the optical properties, wavelength dependent factors, to other deep space models where the solar white can be applied. These are references, I'll quickly point out these two, um, by Dr. Youngquist down at Kennedy. He's the PI for this project. And that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? All right, thank you. Um, I don't see any questions yet, but the stream's still going. It's a little bit, a few seconds delayed. Um, so you, you actually tested the thermal white in in is it look like a little hockey puck is it is it a thick coating or was it around uh like a a different material or is it a thin coating um so are not that thick they're only like three or six meters thick and they also tested uh spray on coatings which are um even lower thickness so okay how, uh, do you know how durable those coatings are? Um, yeah, yeah, I guess it's all relative. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's relevant. I, um, I'm not exactly sure, but I know that it underwent reflectance testing and it's supposed to be flown on, or it's supposed to be used on the space station pretty soon. Oh, I think. Okay. Yeah, I think right now it's up there. So. Excellent. Well, Still don't see any questions. Um, trying to think if I have any other questions. Okay, here's some questions. There we go. So what kind of samples will be sent to the ISS? Uh, is it another compressed power or center sample or will it be like painted coating on a metallic sample? Um, that's a good question. So what I understand I think uh, the samples that are being sent up to the space station are going to be used on a cube set. And I think there's going to be a combination of both tiles and spray on coatings. And that's planned for, I think, it was supposed to be later this year, but because of everything going on, it's like 
early 2021. So I think both types of singles. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. This one's from Jared. Uh, might have mentioned it, but did it have a silver backing? Did it have a silver backing? Um, so for the thermal model and for the uh, testing at DS3, it didn't. But with the silver backing, it, um, that was just the theoretical the test that we ran. But right. Okay. Um, so it's kind of similar to the question that I asked. Is there any research in charring of these samples? So it's kind of like durability and stuff, like, but with reference to charring. Um, there is, I'm not too familiar with it. I know that they're trying to optimize the way that they, um, center the samples. I think the way that they're centered and compressed, I think you can optimize that so that the tiles are stronger. Um, that's about all I know about it. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. We got another question here for the light off case. How is the sample the hottest? Um, so you mentioned the IR leak, but is anything calculated? So, yeah, I guess kind of go over, you know, what, uh, at least I had another question on the IR leak. So that's just leak from just external components getting in the box somehow or coming through the the lens itself. Um, yeah, so it's, a, yeah, it's a combination of both, like you said. So some from external components, some from transmitting through the lens and uh that's pretty much it so the question was the question asking why is the sample warmer the hottest yeah yeah so so like i said from the lamp surface you have that light intensity of 43.1 so that's considered the ir contribution so the silica lens although it does absorb quite a bit of this um, light energy, you still have a good amount getting down to the sample. And also the, uh, the heat load that I didn't mention till the end, that also contributes to it, like the heat load generated by the diodes. So is what you're showing now the light case, the light on case? No, this is the no light. No light? Okay. And then what about the one the slide before? Oh, sorry. I, never mind. I was looking at it at a separate my my copy of the presentation. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, you're right. Sorry, my 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 apologies. No problem. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, here's another question on just the the performance of the coating. Has there been any? Have you seen any outgassing performance of the spray on coating or? Again, had, had any hands-on experience with how delicate the spray-on coating is from like a handling perspective? Like, does it you know, get your hands all dusty? Do you have to worry about uh, rubbing off? I don't know. Do you have any experience with that yourself or have heard anything? Um, I don't personally have any experience with it. That was mostly done down at, uh, by the guys at Kennedy, but um, I think it is pretty delicate. I'm not sure how the outgassing performance is. I have to ask about that. All right. We had a, we had a bunch of questions coming, but I think we got through most, if not all of them. Okay. Um, so does anyone on, on our side of things have any questions? Monica, I think this is, this is about it. So, okay. um, yeah, no, the only other question I'd have um, for you, Jared, is do you know, um, are there any plans for um, modern applications of this on an actual mission, or is this pretty much still in um, just the ISS experiment, kind of the next step? Um, so far, ISS experiments, that's all we have planned, but we're hoping, hoping that um, the near future, it can be, it can be used, because it started off as a well, it's still a night project that started as phase one, phase two, and just kept progressing. So, yeah, hopefully it can be used pretty soon.
All right. I, I think that's it. Um, so thanks. Definitely. Thanks for presenting, Jared. It's really interesting. I look forward to seeing. Oh, sure. That super low absorptivity is could enable a lot of different things. That's that's really yeah. nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you.